Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we turn our attention this morning to subject matter which leaves me very exposed. Um, and by exposed, I, I mean I don't really understand this stuff. I know that the M20, for example, is already uh, a lorry park during the implementation of what's known as Operation Stack. Uh, but I'm just looking at some of the words in a road haulage update that was issued on Monday without mentioning the word Brexit. And I am well, simply telling you what the government has said, um, and it's, I think, really odd. It would seem um, that the interim arrangement for holding lorries on the M20, which would have to happen if we uh, have to have customs checks at our borders, well, as far as I can tell, this is catastrophic. So how are we going to do this this morning? Let's get the phone lines open early so that you can interrupt me and, and prevent me from embarrassing myself. 0345 6060 is the number that you need. I stress again, this is the government's description, not mine. So I don't know much about roads, and I don't know much about Kent, and I don't know much about the M20. I do know that when... Well, actually, let's start from a position of complete ignorance. And what I'd like you to do today is defy my stereotypical conviction that conversations about road-related issues are always a little bit, oh, what does the wife drive? How many miles do you get to the... Do you see what I mean? This is really important. This is, I think, for people living in the affected areas, this is evidence that an already bad situation could about be about to become horribly, horribly worse. So... So can you actually, do you know what we'll start with? Can you translate this for me? We do not know yet whether or not there will be customs checks after Brexit. But I have to tell you now that if we have no deal, then there will be customs checks. If we are not in the customs union, uh, I think there will have to be customs checks. But first up and first off already, I might have made a mistake. Michel Barnier has said this morning, or, or late last night, with regard to the Irish border issues, that nothing will solve that unless the UK remains in the customs union and the single market. If, if the UK does not remain in the customs, this is the European Union's position. It doesn't mean it's, it's infallible. But if they don't stay in the customs, if we don't stay in the customs union and the single market, and that's the whole of the UK, it can't just be an exemption for Northern Ireland, then there'll be a hard border. So you'll have, you'll have checks there on the, on the mainland of Ireland. If you want to ship something from Dover to Calais, under the customs union, I think, and, and I, look, can I, can I confide in you briefly for a minute? Because I know I've got this kind of, almost got this albatross around my neck now with regard to Brexit, because I, I have managed over the last couple of years to, to point out stuff that, frankly, we all should have known before the referendum. And I've been on a real journey of discovery myself with regards to everything from what a customs union actually is to the fact that we had the right and the, and the freedom and the power to control EU immigration considerably more stringently than successive governments elected to. But I, I, I worry sometimes that I come across to you as a bit of a know-it-all. And that, I, I, I'm actually the opposite. When I don't know stuff, I really try to find stuff out. And sometimes I do it with books. Sometimes I get online and do it. And sometimes I can do it with you. I can simply... It's what a privilege it is to be able to throw open the phone lines in this studio and hear from people who actually do know what they're talking about. And the price you pay for that, of course, is the occasional intervention from people who haven't got the first idea what they're talking about but don't uh, currently realise it. But we all, we all have a lot of fun with that. So I can't see how, when people talk about frictionless borders and, and, and what have you, I can't see how anyone can suggest that that's going to happen if it's not happened anywhere else in the world. There are, I don't believe, any examples of two different customs areas, which is what we become with regard to the EU after leaving, that have frictionless borders. I, I, I know that it's probably a little catchphrase that's been put out there by the usual suspects, tug for, locked off cap. Um, vote re-smog, but there aren't any anywhere in the world. That doesn't mean there never will be, okay? Technological, magic thinking solutions 
uh, several years hence. It's, it, it's perfectly possible that they will. It will be doable. You'll be able to track everything in some as yet undefined and unspecified way. And I mean that most sincerely. I. I think it probably will. I mean, for heaven's sake, look at some of the technological advances we've made in the last 50 years and then tell me that we can't find a way of policing borders better. The problem is that other people don't have to. There's no desire to do it because most people are trying to join trading agreements and customs unions. The United Kingdom, in its wisdom, is unique, I think, in trying to leave one. And... And that would mean, as I understand it, so I kind of want hauliers to call me lorry drivers, exporters, people who actually ship a lot of stuff to the continent, you're going to have to have your stuff checked in early 2019, potentially. And that will mean, if I've read this report correctly, that the current potential gridlock on the motorway going into Dover could back up even further. So just translate this for me. This is your starter for 10, all right? It's nine minutes after 10. Completely different flavour to the show today because it's almost as if I'm blindfolded and I'm asking you to lead me to 11 o'clock. Um, this is what I need translating first. The department has now agreed with Highways England that this arrangement should take the form of a contraflow system which would see lorries for the port of Dover and Euro Tunnel held on the coast-bound carriageway between junctions 8 and 9 of the M20. Wake up at the back while other traffic will use a contraflow to continue their journey on the other side of the motorway. Highways England are starting the preparatory works for the scheme now and it will be available from early... 2019. What does that mean? 03456060973. And what do you think if this so called interim arrangement does end up being imposed? What will it look like? Okay? And, and this is it as far as I'm concerned. I've got nothing else. Let me tell you what else is coming up on the program while you prepare yourself to ring in and. Um, Educate, stroke, entertain me. It's, it's quite astonishing, if I've understood it correctly, to reflect that this isn't bigger news. But of course, if, if you're looking at everything through the lens of Brexit and you're a news supplier who has been cheerleading for Brexit, you now start, I suppose, selecting your stories and, and, and covering the news in... Um, a slightly odd way. You start ignoring stuff like this. Coming up later in the programme, I want to return to the story you heard Nick mention, which highlights the, the, the difficulties and the potential absurdities of some of the issues surrounding so-called self-identification and trans. But again, at risk of repetition, this is a, a subject on which I find myself that you have two sides arguing furiously. And if you take a step back from the issue, they both seem to make sense. They both seem to have a lot of points on their side. So we'll have a look at this fellow who got himself onto a women's only shortlist after claiming that he identifies as a woman on Wednesdays. And the other story that I'm going to draw to your attention, well, there's a good story about teachers and um, a government climb down on a pledge to provide more money for literacy. But it's a story involving the police. We'll keep an eye on that Police Federation conference in Birmingham, where Sajid Javid is due to speak in about half an hour. But one senior copper at the conference suggested that wealthy middle-class drug users who take cocaine recreationally are responsible in large part for the deadly knife crime epidemic. And I would, at risk of in inviting you to conclude that I think I've got lots of listeners who either take drugs or deal drugs, I would quite like to get to the bottom of that suggestion as well. Because I have often said to you on the issue of stop and search that if they're really looking for drugs, why aren't they turning people over and dangling them by their ankles outside the, 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 you know, the glamorous night spots of Knightsbridge and Chelsea. You're going to find a lot more drugs falling out of the pockets of those people than you are out of some kids in South London knocking about in a car park. But we, we'll get stuck into that later in the programme as well. Right. Brexit. Borders. Customs. Dover. M20. We are going to make 48 minutes of radio phone in about roads that is absolutely fascinating. I promise you. The countdown clock to the UK leaving the EU has started ticking and there's plenty of headaches for the government ahead. Now, one of the biggest will be what happens at our borders and customs. And this week, the Treasury Select Committee says it has no confidence in the new £70 million system designed to deal with new processes after Brexit. I've been to the UK's busiest port in Dover to see what might happen if things don't go to plan. <laughs> Thank you. 
the iconic white cliffs of Dover, one of the most potent symbols of British pride. It's perhaps unsurprising then that 62% of people here voted to leave the European Union. But this busy port will be on the front line when Brexit happens. Getting the right deal is crucial. You can't get much closer to mainland Europe than Dover. We're only 26 miles away from France. If you really squint, you might just be able to see it. This is the point of arrival for millions of people and goods crossing from the continent. And that's why it might be one of the first places to really feel the consequences of leaving the EU. Every year, the Port of Dover deals with £119 billion worth of trade, 2.5 million freight vehicles and 13 million passengers. Even a small delay in processing this volume of traffic could have huge effects. We probably, on a busy day, handle about 160 kilometres worth of traffic. That's enough traffic to go from Dover along the A20, up the M20, round the M25, over the Dartford crossing, as far as Stansted Airport. If you multiply that um, dramatically, that could mean gridlock across a number of lanes of a motorway. The UK will suffer if we don't get this right. So it could mean prices rising on the supermarket shelves? Prices of fin finished manufacturers could rise, the UK could become less competitive, um, lots of production lines in the Midlands and North could close if we don't get it right. If the border moves from France to the UK, as some have threatened, controlling illegal immigration could become very difficult. A Calais-style jungle camp wouldn't move to Dover. As soon as people managed to reach British shores, they'd try and disperse. If we can't have any UK border force in France at all, so we have no way to check those lorries before they board, and that's not true just of Dover, that's going to be true across every ferry port everywhere, then it won't matter how many staff we've got in the UK. Once those individuals have got in that container and the containers on board the ferry, they are to all intents and purposes here. We're going to have to hear that asylum claim. We're going to have to support them during the time of that asylum claim. At the moment, that can be an easy 18, 24 months, if not longer, depending on how complex it is. Um, that won't matter about how many staff you've got on the border. Those folks are here. They've, they've got the golden grail. Um, and it risks making the UK even more of a magnet for asylum seekers uh, and for irregular migration than it already is. So you could be talking about thousands or even tens of thousands of people. That's the doomsday scenario, yes. Motis Freight Service Agency in Truck Park is at the sharp end of Brexit. Every day the company handles more than 500 vehicles and provides the vital customs link for lorries carrying non-EU goods. Feelings here are mixed. Even though the company's general manager voted to leave, he is cautious about the outcome. Do you think the government realises the amount of effort that's going to need to happen in order to keep everything running smoothly? They've... they've um managed to get, get a Brexit team together so they've, they've obviously recognised the, the need and they spoke to people in the trade as well so there has been a certain amount of expertise. Uh, we've had meetings in, in, in Dover with, with the Treasury uh, through BIFA which is the British International Freight Association um, and, and the customs agent so we've, we've voiced our opinions now we, we hope that they take that information forward to the relevant parties um, to, to provide enough answers for us to be able to look at our business, businesses in two years' time to see if we're in a position to, to cover this, the, 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 the new work. Is the two-year negotiation period at all realistic, you think? <laughs> I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure because uh, we're going to we're gonna lose a two, two months through the French elections and German elections, so they won't be doing nothing for a couple of months. But there's, there's an awful lot of procedures to, 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 to fine-tune before we get to that situation. Whereas his business partner is optimistic on how Brexit will impact Dover. I see uh, Brexit more as an opportunity than a threat. I know there are concerns about how freight might transit through the port, but we've been there before. We, we, it was 25 years ago, there were only a million trucks a year then, and there are four million trucks a year now. But technology has come on leaps and bounds, uh, and I think that technology can smooth the path. Now, if, if we're saying that post-Brexit, everything requires customs clearance again, 98% of that will be processed concurrently in five-minute chunks. So I don't see it as such a, a large issue. After last year's initial certainty that leaving was the right thing to do, Dover now faces a less predictable future as the details of Brexit are negotiated. 
and with the sheer volume of freight that passes through the port, even the smallest mistake could result in this whole area ending up as one gigantic car park. Matthew's at Heathrow. No pressure. Hi, James. Yeah, well, basically, it's going to be a big um, disaster. I mean, it is going to turn into a car park. I mean, we've all seen this already when uh, there is a problem on the tunnel or the ferries. What, what sort uh, of problem causes the massive backups at the moment? Because I, 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 not not for the first time, but it's not a daily occurrence. I had to seek Nick Ferrari's advice and expertise on this issue, and he, he told me that there have been occasions when things have backed up as far as Kidbrook which yeah. is about eight miles from London. So if it's going to get worse than that, then obviously the possibility of it backing all the way up to London perhaps comes into... Yeah, that's right. I mean, basically what happens is, that, I mean, they've got like phase one, phase two and phase three. But I mean, like any little hiccup on the tunnel, if they have to cancel trains or they go to a single tunnel operation with maintenance, right. uh, that just slows... Uh... So it's already a bottleneck, to use a technical term. Yeah, but I think what's going to happen is it's going to basically just increase costs because, I mean, I used to operate nightly flights to Europe uh, for express mail and cargo, but since the opening of the Channel Tunnel and uh, since we started competing with all the trucks with the quicker service since they've um, had the open borders in 1995, uh, basically the volumes have increased, but eventually... I mean, those volumes are going to start decreasing. Costs are going to go up, and most of the companies are going to have to have bases in Europe. I mean, the supply, chain, supply chains are not going to be by uh, London anymore. Well, what, what does that mean? I, I, I'm, going, I'm only giving you five out of ten for making... I'm going to use the, the word sexy. I want this conversation to be sexy today, and um, I appreciate that I've put an awful lot of pressure on you, but in the sexiness states, you're only getting five out of ten. What does that mean, the transport supplies would have to go somewhere else? Well, basically... I mean, the stuff what's been manufactured in the UK, uh, basically they've got to get the parts from Germany. Those parts have to be here overnight. If they don't, at the moment, it all goes by road because there's no customs checks. What's going to happen is we're going to have to go back to, and it's not going to be good for the environment, there'll be light aircrafts doing express deliveries. But they'd still have to packages. have customs checks as well. But yeah, but you see, it, you, there's no queue. When you go into a small airport, you literally, there is customs there, you do clearance, it's just one clearance, you're just clearing one item, but it increases the cost. And what's then going to happen is all these companies, what needs these goods in the UK, they're going to move their operation to the continent. And um, basically, so, I mean, eventually, <laughs> when the volumes fall down, then yeah, the queues are going to... You, you speak as if it's inevitable. Um, yeah, well, no, no, no. I, I, I've still got a bit of faith in Theresa May that they are going to get a free trade deal. It, I mean, we're going to be. I, I, but then I'm we will be in the customs even... union and probably the single market. Well, yeah, we're going to be leaving in name only. Hopefully, we'll have a tailored customs. Yeah, but, but union I, I mean, a lot of people aren't going to like that because they still the penny still hasn't dropped. But the the. I, it, if, if I'm sending something to the continent, it currently goes through unmolested. Even, even unmolested, unchecked, un, un, um, uh, examined, we still have situations where occasionally the, the passage is impossible and the lorries back up all the way, yeah, all the way yeah. up the motorway. So if we then, even if it's a very cursory check, if we then have to check everything in some way, shape or form that's going out of the country for sale, then... Without, um, with the same infrastructure in place with the regard to the tunnels and the roads, then, then you're looking at an absolute nightmare. And then I think, yeah. I'll, I'll level with you, mate, then I have a little voice in the back of my head that goes, shut up, James, you don't understand roads. You're not right about everything. And if there's anything that you're usually wrong about, it's transport-related. And also, no one else is going mad about this. So by the laws of news, it can't be as big a deal as you think it is. Yeah, no, well, it is going to be a big deal. It's going to change transport completely. I mean, basically, uh, there are security checks, and as soon as there's a hiccup, I mean, basically, um, you know, that, that then makes something tell back. But if you start introducing customs clearances, I mean, they're not going to be able to even check the stuff in Calais. So and and is there any way in which you can have... I mean, this is a, not your field of expertise, but you can't have... Cust what phrase did you just use? Customs checks, did you say? Yeah, well, they have to basically have documentations. Everything what 
it leaves the UK, it has to have an export document uh, for every item. And uh, they, for, so if it's, if it's one truck full of all the same goods, I mean, that is just one document. Right. But if it's a groupage, and at the moment that's how it works for Europe, it's mainly groupages. There's one but this, truck, but this, what, sounds, this sounds as if, as if we've got a, a potentially an absolutely enormous problem that nobody is talking about. Well, yeah, there will be a problem there if we don't get some sort of customs agreement. But they're insisting that they don't want one still, the hard Brexit people. This is the whole no deal, uh, don't stay in the customs union, Brexit in name only. But, but again, Matthew's only one caller. The phone lines are open. 0345. Thank, I'm going to raise this 5 out of 10 to a 6.5. 0345 6060 I'm also probably going to read out a few more... Um, should we say less friendly texts and tweets than I usually do today, just to highlight the levels of ignorance surrounding these issues, OK? Because uh, there's already suggestions that countries like Switzerland manage perfectly all right. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'll explain why that's daft in a moment. Is this a castle in the sky, or is it a massive nightmare just on the horizon that everybody's pretending isn't there because it would involve admitting a, a, another massive flaw in Brexiters? planning and reasoning and, and most of the news providers in this country are still struggling to to be that honest. I don't know. I'm talking about the... And, and also a lot of people coming in to, and, and, and telling me off and saying your predictions are so wrong, you're so doom and gloom. This isn't me. This is the Parliamentary Undersecretary of State for Transport describing an interim arrangement that has to be prepared because of the possibility of us coming out of the European Union without having a trade agreement in place. And the trade agreement would have to involve membership of or subscription to all the rules of the current customs union. Otherwise, there'll be customs checks in Dover. Cool, oh, blimey. And that, that's not me. This isn't me. This is the Parliamentary Undersecretary of State for Transport. So, listen, you know me. I've got skin like a rhinoceros, so throw all the brickbats you want. But in the interests of, of Kent, the people of Kent, for heaven's sake, um, recognise this isn't me being a doommonger. This is me describing the government's plans for a post-customs union border. And it's terrifying. And I don't even live in Kent. I've hardly ever been there. Kieran's in Romford. Kieran, can you calm our nerves? No. Oh. Have you got anything else to say? <laughs> well, James, I, I see what I do. I, I run vans weekly out to Brussels and Paris for Eurostar. Um, Blimey, you're pretty close to being a bang on the money, aren't you? Um, I don't know what's happened to your phone. Is it, can you come off hands-free or get it a bit closer to your gob? Can you hear my loudspeaker? Can you hear me? No, it's awful. It sounds like you're in the tunnel. Can you hear me now? There you go. Start again. So you run fleets of vans. Oh, to... My speed's on about 10%. Um, I run weekly vans. I'm just about to jump in one of my work vans now. You're very I'm... close to getting a Rayleigh Automate. So you, are you, where are you going today in your work van? Paris. Boom. I'm Rayleigh Oda, and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. If you build it. They will come. Uh, for people who don't know, and I just realised Kieran might be one of them, that is an honour that we reserve for people who are phoning in to talk about a story that they are currently smack in the middle of. So carry on, Kieran. Right. I have got a contract with Eurostar. Right. Um, I run out same-day deliveries. I've got a van on the way back from Brussels at the moment on a same-day. Uh, right. The trains um, with supplies. Right. Um, so he was sent out at the early hours of the morning, out to Brussels, reload Brussels, back to London. Um, I go out to Paris, I tip Paris, reload Paris, back to London. Twice, two, three times a week I do it. Um, no customs checks. All I have to do is run out the goods on what's called a CMR ball, which is an international delivery note. Right. Um, if we go outside the customs union in any sense of the imagination... Uh, we will need to do what is called transit documents. They cost 75 to 90 quid a pop. You have to go to Customs House in Dover to clear them. You have to park up. If you get sent down what is called a Route 1, which I've had before, you're stuck there for six to seven hours waiting to clear them. On a good day, you can be in and out in 45, 50 minutes. Um, so, and, and, and Customs House... But how many, how many vehicles potentially would have to do that if we were outside the Customs Union? All of them. And all of them would take 45 to 50 minutes? Uh, well, that's on a quiet day if you're going in at night. No, no, this is scary, mate, because I, 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 I I, look, I've laid out what I thought I understood, and then I admitted I know nothing. 
You live and work and depend upon this free movement of goods completely. Yes, you do it every single yes. day, often several times a day. And if I've understood you correctly so far, you're saying it's even worse than you thought, James. I've said all along a vote to leave would be a vote to leave the customs union, which scared me. And I knew it would possibly be the beginning of the end for express van transport in this country. The just-in-time supply chain yes. is already suffering. A big, a massive Polish company has already gone bust in Poland because of the drop of just-in-time movements of goods and the vehicle um, automotive industry. Why would that have happened already, though, Kieran? Well, no, because what they do, they they have set budgets. Right. Like you know, all the car plants have set budgets on what they want to spend every year um, to get their overnight stuff. You you want a pallet of air filters from France going to Luton. You pick it up at four o'clock in the evening and it's at the doorstep in Luton at eight o'clock the next morning. And, and if it isn't, then whatever you're building in Luton doesn't get built and everything gets... Well, well the production line stops, you know. Um, it, it and this will be true in, uh, in Sunderland, this will be true in all... I mean, I, I saw a just-in-time explanation of what goes on at the Nissan plant in Sunderland and, and yeah. the, 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 the margins are like minutes, aren't they? You, you, you lose a minute somewhere and it could actually stop a conveyor belt halfway around the factory. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I, I picked up an urgent job out of Stuttgart, um, and I had to give them updates every hour where I was. It was going to the Dagenham Ford engine plant, where yeah. they only build engines now, um, because the, 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 it had stopped. I would literally done a same-day delivery from Stuttgart to Dagenham non-stop. <sighs> what, 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 uh, when, what, when the referendum happened and the result came through. What did you think would be in place by now, two years later? Because this is, well, if I've understood you correctly, your livelihood's under threat, right, as we speak. Do you know, do you, do you know what, James? Go on. No, but when that, when, when, that, when that vote came in, I cried. Oh, God. And, right? I knew that everything I'd built up over the last 15 years of doing this job was going to be finished. We are, whether you like it or not, we are a foreign-owned production line in this country where we are owned by outside interests, and we put things together. We are not like Germany, where we own BMW, mm. you know, where we own Audi, we own VW. We, we, we got BMW Mini in Oxford, Sunderland, Swindon, Honda. You know, they're all foreign-owned, and they're all here because they've got access to the single market and they've got the freedom of movement of goods where you do not need transit documents and you do not need car names. And I, I'll tell you, I'll give you another example. Yeah, please do. Exhibitions, goods and services, going to exhibitions. If you go to Norway or Switzerland and you've got 100 brands worth of exhibition stuff in the back of your van, mm. you've got to pay 25% up front before it even goes into the country. Right? Yeah. That will put people out of business overnight. Of course it will. Hopefully, we, we've had to do it. Why, why, and this isn't your field of expertise, it's, it's ostensibly mine, but does it, does it baffle you that, that, that the coverage is so low and so confused? Because it's clear to you what's going on. You hear politicians, and obviously some of them on this radio station, saying stuff about the customs union that's palpably absurd. They're going unchallenged, not really because of bias, but because of ignorance. This is your field of knowledge. This is literally your specialist subject. I'll tell you what I've been doing, James. Go on been calling out the liars on Twitter. Yeah. Hurry, goes out to Switzerland for an hour, stands at a border and says it's frictionless. Yeah. Who'll believe it? I put a million pictures on there. I put a picture of a transit document, a carnate, and a, and a, and a CMR form. I said, list me what those forms do, how you fill them out and what they cost. Didn't get a reply. Who was that? Right. That was Kate Hurry. Yeah. She's standing on a border crossing. She got obviously... Oh, she went into I think the and Daniel Hannan's yeah. taken a picture of himself somewhere as well and said it's all really oh, easy. I called him out as well. I called him out and called him a liar. I've got actual pictures on my phone of going through the Swiss border in Basel and coming out at Lake Como. And I tell you now, it's far from frictionless. When you, when you go in... I tell you what, Swiss, the Swiss border closes at 5 o'clock on a Friday evening and reopens at 9 o'clock on a Monday morning. Good grief. You can't enter with commercial goods. Yeah, for people, I don't want people to get confused. It's in Schengen, so if you're on your holidays, you can cross over to your heart's content. You but if you're... Cross, yes, 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 yeah. you can. As long as you get, as long as you get your vignette, yeah. you can cross, but you still have to drive down the motorway that will end and drive underneath a big customs plaza with the police standing there, and you've still got a chance of getting stopped. Yeah. Uh, and this... Unless your goods are running on what is called a carne, 
right, which is a passport for your goods if they go from multiple place to place. They cost £650 to compile. I've done one. Yeah. I've done one to Norway. 650 quid. I had to go and pick it up from the Department of Trade in London. And it took them a week to put together. And my customer said, they're never going to Norway to do an exhibition again. I don't know if I should do this, but why, why did, could, I'm late for the news. You, you've, you've blown the story wide open. I, I, anyone who's doubting it, first of all, saying it's all my fault for... Um, uh, making these predictions, and then I point out it's actually the government. You do his is one genius saying, "Oh yeah, you've got your mate to phone in." Nice one. This <laughs> desperation people have to believe that the, the, the unicorns are coming. It's quite incredible because this is you. You run a haulage company. You're not some Remainer academic or some metropolitan. Oh. You, you, you're a blinking van driver who's built up a business, and now you're about to see it go down the toilet because of Brexit. Well, I am, and I tell you what, I need another van. Because my work's actually expanded, but I'm scared to buy one. Because? Steve, I'll be left with a van. I've got to pay finance on, and they're not cheap, and I might lose my contract. So what do I do? Do I buy one? Do I not buy one? You know, <sighs> the real situation, and I'll tell you something, James, oh. I'll tell you something. There's one person in, in the Tory backbenches who we all know very well that wants a hard Brexit. And he wants it for himself because of his emerging market companies that he's got. You know, look at the, what an emerging market is. There's only one reason why he wants a Brexit, because we will be an emerging market. It's a form of disaster capitalism that's coming. The M20 in Kent will be a permanent operation stack. And I'll tell you something, where are the lorry drivers going to go to the toilet? Where are they going to get and food? How are the people who live around there going to get their kids to school and do the shopping? I, I, I just want to read you very quickly because I'm very late for the... And I want you to... I, I, want, I want to keep your number because we tried to find an expert to talk to today, um, yep. which is a bit against the, the rules of the programme. I always want to rely on callers, but I didn't think it would work today. Mate. Again, I was wrong and also right at the same time because I should have relied on callers. But I just want to read you a few things, OK? Just quickly. Bloke is a legend. I love this caller. What great information. This guy is literally giving the clearest insights into the pitfalls of Brexit in the simplest way I have ever heard. Wow just wow amazing call really interesting discussion about the nuts and bolts of brexit and it goes on so i would remind you that the backbencher you've referred to does sit in this studio on a fortnightly basis and there's nothing to I stop you I will ask him there's nothing to stop you ringing him kieran unfortunately i can't you know offer up any preferential no, no, treatment or secret passages onto the switchboard but i shall say it now live on the radio i hope you get through to jacob rees mogg next time he's sitting in this studio mate don't worry, and I'll tell you something, James. Quick. I've got some very interesting questions for Mr. Mogg, and he will not be able to answer them because they'll be interesting. Well, at least to give the man credit, at least he will expose himself to those questions, I'm sure. 10.33 is the time. Kieran, wow, thank you. And um, a lot of love coming in for Kieran. A couple of suggestions, and I, I think I will mention this. Um, I, I normally ignore such idiocy, but I will. A couple of people suggesting that that was somehow staged. This is increasingly happening on this programme, in that people who aren't yet ready to admit reality think that reality is uh, a performance art that we put on. So Beth and I sit there in the morning and say, oh, can, can we, uh, how's your actor friend? Do you think he could come on, call himself Kieran and pretend to be running a transport business, dealing daily with express deliveries to Brussels and Paris? Yes, I'll give him a ring now. We'll have to pay him equity rates. I, for heaven's sake, guys, just wake up, will you? Please. 10.39 is the time. Faisal Islam is, of course, the political editor at Sky News. And um, I believe it was Faisal who uncovered this ministerial statement. You, you must have mornings where you feel a bit like me, Faisal. You, 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 you find yourself wondering... Well, actually, no, you've got better news instincts than I will ever have. So you knew this was a massive story. I read it on your Twitter feed and found myself thinking, is this as big as it appears to be? Well, I think... Uh, well, morning, James. I think there's a couple of ways to look at... This. I think the government would argue that this is, like, part of the necessary preparations uh, that you have to put in. Actually, they say that it's got nothing to do with Brexit. It would have happened regardless of Brexit. That this is a... You know, we saw what happened with Operation Stack three or four years ago uh, with 30-mile paybacks. But I think that, really, you can't read that statement without seeing the timing of getting everything ready for an interim solution by March 20... So by early 2019, you can't really see that in any other way than in trying to keep to some sort of timetable uh, around... Uh, and, and why would they uh, not... Why, just, why, why would they not admit that? What, 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 I mean, is it just optics? Is it because of the necessity to, to try to keep the news about Brexit as positive as they can? I do think that there is a bit of that. I, I think that they just don't want to kind of brand associate their Brexit plans with anything that they may perceive to be a hassle yes. or negative. I, mean, I, I think that 
that is there. Uh, but you know, when I, I mean, when I asked, well, why is it early 2019? They said, well, it doesn't really make much sense. They said because we've got to order several tens of thousands of cones. Cones. And tell, yeah, and tell um, <laughs> John Major. Tell, John Major is back in the news. <laughs> it's, it's the cone hotline all over again. <laughs> Well, well. If, if anyone, if anyone, if anyone does big cones, I think they're in for a, in for a bonanza. Buy cones, uh, Axel. Get on the phone. Try and buy up the cones. <laughs> get loads of cones, mate. We'll flog them at a premium. Seriously, we shouldn't. We shouldn't laugh. I just spoke to a, a fellow who runs express van deliveries through Euro Tunnel, and and he, under these proposals, or indeed under any post Brexit deal that doesn't involve pretty much full customs union membership, he's out of business by by tea time. So I think the thing about this plan called Operation Block. Brock. Mm. It'll cost twenty five million. It'll only be activated if there is um, any severe cross channel uh, issues in terms of the flow of trade. Uh, but I, you know, it's probably sensible to put in contingencies in place. Of course, it shows what what's up for grabs. Thirteen miles of the coast bound M twenty uh, would be turned into basically a lorry park, and at those junctions, eight and nine, pretty much Maidstone to Ashford you would uh, turn the other carriageway going into London, you'd turn that into a contraflow system for cars. Um, and I think what it shows is, I think what people are beginning to be educated about is that the whole system there on the 20, the Channel Tunnel, is just designed for free free traffic. And, 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 and the t- the, the t- it's hard to see how the tunnel... This phone line's not great, Faisal, I, 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 I've got to say. So I, I'm just going to repeat what you said. The whole of the Channel Tunnel... Um, operation is built upon the presumption of completely free travel, completely free movement, and if that if that goes, then the tunnel becomes something of a of a white elephant potentially. Well, and here's the really funny thing, James, which is that you go there as I did a couple of months ago, and there's just no preparations, there's no planning going in. There's a bit of money, there's a few more customs officers being recruited, but you don't get the impression there or at Dover or at any port that you go to that any of the plans that would follow. Uh, like night follows day, mm. the idea that we'll leave the customs union being put in place. Now, you have this transition period, but you only get the transition period if you get a deal. So yeah, there is a real puzzle about this because you'd expect to see changes. They're making changes in Rotterdam, the Dutch government. Uh, so, I mean, I do, it's, it's deeply puzzling when you <laughs> go to these places. So this is, this is, this is at least a virtual plan. Um, they were knocked back on a more permanent plan to, to uh, you know, make a massive lorry park somewhere near the M20. Yes. At the moment, and here's, this is amazing, there's a, there's a truck stop. There's one truck stop just off the M20 that serves both the Euro Tunnel and the Port of Dover, and it has 82 lorry car parking spaces. Good grief. You, you could probably host your show there just about. <laughs> It's not a bad should. idea, actually, mate. <laughs> Will you come on if we do. And, you can, you can. And, the, and the space, and the space, and you have to go to the Euro Tunnel to understand how limited the scope for change is. And I do think it would be a really smart idea to hold one of these cabinet meetings, subcommittee meetings, where they all squabble yes. in the space that they have theoretically available for change. all the traffic that would need to be checked on the not, way out. There, there's no space there. And on the way there's back as well, of course, there. because you, you're going to have similar problems in Dunkirk and, and Calais and places like that. Well, you don't have to answer this question, and I mean that most most um, <laughs> honestly and sincerely. W- why are our colleagues in this business not covering stuff like this more assiduously? Why isn't this on the front page of newspapers instead of Michael Gove's wood-burning stoves? Um, I, th- I think some of, it, some of it's quite complicated, actually, and people yes. tend to default to the Punch and Judy show aspect of this, like who's up and who's down. Yes. But there, there are serious things to cover, and it's not all going in one direction. It goes in the other direction in terms of the argument. I think we're in the middle of, middle of a bit of a culture war where people, you know, you can't, you can't sort of argue from the basis of what's the impact of this set of policies. Right now, whatever happens, there's going to be some sort of impact. Some people think it'll be positive. Some people think it'll be negative. Then there's an issue of competence about planning, and, and there's plenty of stories to be done. I, probably some people find them quite boring. I personally find them quite interesting. I'm a bit of a nerd. Um, well, you brought me on so side. We... I had to convince the producer that this was going to be interesting. She was deeply sceptical, but she's having humble pie during the next commercial break. Well, uh, well... Uh, Your nerdiness is infectious. Like... Infectious nerdiness. Well, there's a bunch of other stuff like this. Uh, again, you know, we, we got hold of a, a memo last week from the Office of Nuclear Regulation 
that had a risk analysis of our nuclear safety, well. our yeah. safety. Five red, amber, green, all five high-level risks were on red in this memo. Um, and so you just, wonder, you just wonder how ready we are, in particular, for no deal uh, in March 2019. Uh, it's an entirely legitimate question. Now, the, the issue is, I think there's a dynamic in British politics where if you try and investigate any of the potential consequences of the decisions politicians are making, it's either doom-mongering or it's totally inevitable. And there's nothing in the middle where you're like, okay, well, let's just actually explore this. I don't, you know, you could probably blame maybe a little bit George Osborne for this, for over-regging the immediate impact of mm. the Brexit vote. The Project but Fair just line. Because, well, just because that didn't happen in its entirety doesn't mean that some of those concerns aren't worthy of investigation. That's how I put it. Um, um, and, 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 you know, and, and we'll see. You know, I, after I did the story about M20, one of the operators who I'd previously interviewed said, you know, we've seen no progress. We're, we're worried. We've seen no progress on this in six months. And it's the government. To be clear, it's the government's responsibility to be doing this. It's not. It's not that the, the, the private sector interest, interest or the business itself or the port of Dover can do anything on a, on an infrastructure level. It's it's government policy that is utterly absent. Well, no, it's, it's the private sector's responsibility, but they have to have some clarity as to where things are going. I think things calm yes. down a bit. So they, they can't build it unless they know what they're building for. Exactly. So Got you it. need to know. What, and it's not just right. about customs and tariffs. It's also about checking animal uh, produce, plants... All of this, and, and it is March 2019. Oh, oh, go on quickly, because you... my investigations on this. Yeah. Did you know that fish swim through the Channel Tunnel? Did you know that? I didn't know so that. They, they, get fished, they get fished in Scotland, and they get transported to the finest restaurants in France through the Channel Tunnel in seawater tanks. And on on wheels? Thing, you, yeah, in, in a truck. In a, oh. in, in a, not a frozen truck. Now, uh, this is because they're so sought after in the top French restaurants. Now, the point is, you cannot have that truck stuck in a 13-mile uh, uh, lorry car park on the M20 no. and multiply that by thousands. And the government's aware of this, but just, yeah, I think people think that a solution will just come up. But So it's know, like it's, Ireland it's times... Like times on our side. Times a thousand. Faisal, thank you. I, I, I think we could... I'll have a chat with you off air, actually, and, and see if we can possibly make it a regular occurrence to have a proper look at some of the stuff that you're unearthing. Of course, you could see it on Sky News as well, but um, as he said himself, that nuclear story, I, I think I forgot to mention that to you, but it, 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 it's, it, it, there's a system in place to, like, register the risk um, in certain sectors if deals aren't put in place. And all five... This is nuclear. OK, this isn't sort of blue passports. This is nuclear, and all five were red. Um, you can follow Faisal on Twitter. In fact, I would suggest if you follow Faisal and Kieran, my first caller, second caller today, you'll probably end up by tea time knowing more about any of these issues than Theresa May, Philip Hammond and Jacob rees mogg put together. It's, it's a real sense of crisis that's building, and, and I don't mean that... Uh, I, I know I'm going to have to spend the rest of my career saying this. No, none of us derive any pleasure from being proved right when what we're being proved right about is a, an explanation, not even a prediction, an explanation of why things are not going to go the way that the, the so-called Brexiters told you they would. I, I, I told you at the time that I was embarrassed by what my vote was motivated by, because a large part of my motivation for not voting to leave the European Union was based upon simply not wanting to throw red meat to racists. I get more exposed to that corner of the country than, than most people do, and, and I knew that as soon as that happened, people would think they were allowed to be racist. It would somehow validate racism. Most people who voted to leave are probably feeling a lot more comfortable about immigration than they were before they voted. The polling suggests this, actually, because they're not having it shouted at them every day, that they're about to be invaded by alien hordes. They're not seeing it on every single front page. They're reading about wood-burning stoves, not Romanians. So most people who voted to leave, even if immigration was one of their key concerns, are now a lot less concerned about immigration because the, you know, the people selling tickets for the ghost train have, have moved on to fill their boots elsewhere. But the really nasty people, the kind of people who were l lapping up the breaking point posters and that, that kind of thing, the really unpleasant individuals, I knew that they would get a massive almost like Viagra for racists from this. And, and that was a large part of my vote. And that's a fairly sad reason. It shows how uninformed I was. But the other part of the reason was the people. Actually, the people doing the cheerleading. That's why I feel such 
animosity really towards Michael Gove because for for good or for ill, I, I always quite liked him as a politician, um, even as Education Secretary, don't shoot me down. But the rest of them, it was almost like a roll call of the least reliable and least honest people in public life in Britain. It's why the so-called intellectual ones have been among the first to fall apart, the first to crumble, the first to um, throw their hands up in despair and blame it all on Remainers. So I mention that because this is an advert that the Port of Dover took out. And I, 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 this, again, is, is due to you sending it to me, uh, the, the kind of crowd-sourced nature of the programme at the moment. is really coming into its own. So this was the political editor of The Spectator tweeted this in October of last year when he was at the Conservative Party conference. So just think about this for a minute, OK? In case you're sending me text saying, Kieran was, was a stooge or um, uh, I can't believe all this doom mongering. This is me describing the government's explanation of what it's going to do on the M20 with regard to um, customs. And what Kieran told us is how that will affect people who are in the business of moving stuff in and out of the country to the continent. So the Port of Dover themselves, OK, bought advertising at the Conservative Party conference. And I'm now going to tell you exactly what was in that advert. It's a screen advert, so it's a moving animation, OK? And this was, if you like, their warning of what would happen if there was no deal. It's pretty straightforward, and I'm not going to be able to play it now, so I'll play that to you in a second. <laughs> um, it, it basically describes what the current situation is and what the situation will be after a no deal form of Brexit. So a lorry is currently processed in two minutes flat. This smooth flow of traffic is made possible by the absence of customs clearance in the port of EU goods and on goods from elsewhere by transit. OK, so after Brexit, the UK will no longer be a part of transit. Even if it took just an extra two minutes to process a lorry, it would cause queues of over 17 miles at Dover. There would be similar chaos in Calais and Dunkirk. The UK must be a member of the Common Transit Convention. It will keep goods moving through the port of Dover, which will keep the Republic of Ireland, the UK and Europe trading with each other. Doverport.co.uk. Paid to have that little film on hoardings, billboards, advertising sites at the Conservative Party conference last year. So people like Rhys Mogg and Duncan Smith and Liam Fox and David Davis, they were walking past this very, very simple explanation from the people that actually run the port of Dover, explaining why any prospect of no deal or even exemption, absence, removal from the customs union would create absolute chaos on British and French but more importantly for our purposes this morning, British soil. They were walking past it. It was there in front of them. So, again, I'm sorry that we weren't across this quicker. Kieran, apparently, uh, is, is, is quite well known on forums for explaining to people precisely how his business is being affected. I uh, politely declined to do question time on Thursday because I'm increasingly reluctant to be a performer in a pantomime. I tell you what I might do. I might text the producer back and tell them to get Kieran on. Problem is, the questions will probably be about wood-burning stoves rather than about the actual reality of the unfolding Brexit. 10.57 is the time. Alex is in Wiltshire. Alex, what would you like to say? Good morning to you, James. First time caller. You're very welcome. Um, thank you very much. I just wanted to concur on exactly what uh, Kieran's been saying. I have a small company that imports and exports telecoms equipment around the world. And obviously when we bring uh, equipment in from, say, America or from China or Japan, we have to pay customs clearance, we have to pay duties, we have to pay the dreaded VAT. Yes. Now, I'm a... I wanted to stay in the EU for many reasons, rather like your good self. It's sort of... I'm not not their biggest fan, but I would rather be in a club than on the outskirts. Of it. Yes. And for me, um, when I am importing stuff from the States, once it comes to, to my offices here and I then ship them out to, say, Germany or Spain, there is so little paperwork to be dealt with, and there is no VAT after that, and it is streamless, which is what it's all about. And unfortunately, I see if we do leave the European Union, if it does continue, then you will have a much, much greater cost with everything that you're bringing in from outside the EU. VAT, obviously, is one thing we have to pay regardless. I mean, so, we haven't even mentioned yeah. delays. So how... I don't well, want to depress you um, unduly, but you've obviously given it thought. You'd be daft not to have done. If we leave the customs union and there therefore needs to be friction or customs checks, and as the port of Dover themselves have explained, even if it's just an increase of two minutes, that's 17 miles, what happens to your business? 
book because that's exactly it. You know, we have to deliver goods at a certain time that we give in our contract. And this is why I'm really concerned about this. And I know when the vote came out, a lot of my friends in business who voted the other way to, to Brexit and, and, and leave the, the EU, I was pretty disgusted, really, because these are people that run fairly large corporations. Yes. And, you know, it, it's almost naive to believe that everything's going to be perfect. I, I Obviously, I hope it is. I don't think it will be. Of course. But it's just shocking. It's shocking to think that people have no concept of how either business operates and how it would affect the average person. So clearly, you know, if you're going to bring stuff in from, let's say, Spain, and you're working for Waitrose, well, obviously, you will now have to pay VAT on all the goods that are coming in. I think the only thing that's exempt on VAT is child's or children's clothes and goods. Yes. So I ever, don't know ever about ever this. this is, you're, you're educating me on this. I mean, I'm not never embarrassed to admit that. Well, hardly, James. I'm hardly doing that. But it, it is, it's just frustrating that the, the general public really don't have a clue and it's not well, there the, i'm frustrated the general cabinet been... mate doesn't have a clue i find that considerably more frustrating it, it, it's, it's that line that popped out of my mouth on monday about there aren't actually any grown-ups it's just us um that was an education wasn't it it's an astonishing calls again and thanks to faisal islam the political editor of sky news who appears to i haven't seen him for a while appears to share some of my uh, confusion perhaps about why certain aspects of um, the unfolding Brexit reality are, are not currently getting the coverage, particularly in the newspapers, that the, the people need. The people need and deserve, however you voted. You, we need to know this stuff so that if, you know, we do need to be, well, you know what they say, forewarned is forearmed. So we will keep an eye on this um, and hopefully um, see some movement from government on actually addressing the concerns, given that March 2019 is the self-imposed deadline. Five minutes after 11 is the time. I am, however, I I'm going to just take a moment to bask in the knowledge that we managed to conduct an hour-long phone-in, essentially a about a road-related issue that scaled dizzying heights of interest and illumination. Well done, us. <laughs>